All right, the church is in the house today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I said the church is in the house today. Huh? You know, we've always been the church, but we hadn't been in the house for three months. You know, people used to say, well, they go up to the church house. And I thought, well, that sounds awful country, go to the church house. You know, but really that's all this is. It's just the, the building that houses the church that comes. And we've got churches meeting all across our land today. And I'm thankful for that. And I know you are too. You know, I walked out this morning and, uh, and it, the air was nice and cool. And I thought it sure would be a nice day to sit on the patio and drink coffee and then go sit down on the couch and uh, watch the church on TV, you know. But uh, how many of you thought about that this morning, really? Come on, be honest with me. You thought about, yeah, you thought about that too, didn't you? But you know what? The excitement of coming back together was greater than the desire to go sit on uh, there at church on the couch, huh? (laughs) Anyway, we're glad you're here this morning. It's so good. I hope I can still preach when people are here. It's been really weird. And we come up and we have our worship service and then some of the worship team stays and we sit here and preach in the empty pews. One man said, oh, I'm used to preaching to empty looking faces. It's no different to me, you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm used to preaching to smiling faces and to happy faces and people who are glad to be here. And uh, I'm glad to be here. You know, the Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, let us come into the house of the Lord. And I can't believe it's been literally three months since we were met here. May, uh, March 15th was the last Sunday we met here. Who knew after March 15th it was going to occur into this, but here it is, June 14th, and we're back together. A lot of things have happened, you know. We've had uh, babies have grown a lot, haven't they? I'm talking about babies that haven't been born yet. They're growing, aren't they? Time's getting closer. Kids have grown. I've walked up, and some of them are tall as I am now. And I've looked around and things have changed. We've had some surgery since we uh, met last. So we've had a lot of things happen, but it's just good to be back together. I'm thankful for being here with you. And uh, it was so fun uh, getting up into Sunday mornings. You know, since we couldn't come to church, we had to do the best we could. So we did have a, you know, a leisure morning and looking forward to coming online. But I had such a good time coming online and going on our Facebook page and seeing everybody sign in. It was just so, it's almost like we, it was the closest thing to being able to, to visit together, wasn't it? It was just fun seeing people come in, making comments and, and adding comments. Somebody finally realized that, uh, that hey, how is he talking and preaching at the same time? <laughs> and I didn't realize that on Thursday nights we would come up and do our service and get them ready. So that way we could edit it and have everything just right. But today we're back to live. So if we mess up today, it's just a mess up. You know, <laughs> it's just a mess up. But I am so thankful for those who are joining us online. For Facebook, uh, we appreciate you being there. Make a comment there and tell us that you're watching, where you're watching from. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we're glad that you're here. Or if you're watching from our website, we appreciate you coming. And uh, during this time, we've really literally had people watching from a lot of different places. around South America, some in Peru. Our pastor friend there, Pastor Francisco Luna, uh, doesn't speak English, but he came online and said, Hola, uh, Pastor McMichael, you know, so uh, we had them, had people in Mexico watching, people in Costa Rica watching, we had people uh, in uh, Thailand watching, people in Canada, people all across the United States and from the West Coast to the East Coast, so it's been a really good time, it's still an opportunity to reach out and we're excited to be able to do that. I'm just so thankful that we weren't doing like a lot of pastors I've talked to, they said as soon as this thing happened, they went to scrambling trying to figure out how to get their services online. And I'm thankful that our tech team already had us doing live services, so all we had to do, (laughs) all we had to do was just go ahead and put them online like we've been doing. And so we're we're thankful for that. You know, I'm going to tell you this, and and this is is a tribute and a credit, a credit to you guys and all of our church, but our church flourished during this time. It really did. Uh, people were faithful. We've caught people called, people touched, based, texted, and so forth. And, and so I really feel like we flourished during this time. So if we flourish during that time, I think we're going to explode in this time. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, if you'll turn with me in your Bible, we're going to be looking at uh, two scriptures, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 12 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. And we're in the second part of a message, a series called These Last Days. How many of you really, really seriously believe that we're in last days? Really? 
I do too. I really do. I'm telling you, I don't have time to go into it today, but probably next week or the next week, we're going to talk about the signs and the times and the seasons. And I'm telling you, if you blink, you miss it. It's happening every day. There is a there is a spirit, a move that is set to totally wrap this thing up as the Bible says it's going to wrap up. So if we still get to meet next week, we may be meeting in the air or may be meeting there. But one way or other, we're going to talk about uh, the times that we live in and where we are. But today I want to talk about uh, in these days, why must I fight? And I'm not talking about fighting amongst each other. There's too much of that going, but it seems like Everybody we talk to, and ourselves included, we're in the midst of a fight. There's a war going on. It's intensified. These last three months, it's intensified tremendously. In fact, these last three months have been a part of that whole scheme, I believe. And we'll talk about that later. But why must we fight? And I'm going to read a scripture out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. He said to, Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. There's not but one kind of good fight. As growing up, I hate to tell you this, but as a kid, I got in some fights. Used to fight. I don't know. Kids used to fight. I don't know if they fought more then or I was just aware of it more then. But, you know, there was only one kind of good fight. That's the one that you won. It's not a good fight if you lose. You may have fought hard and valiantly, but if you, if you lose, you don't feel like that was a good fight. And Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. That means win this thing. We need to win this thing. We can win this thing. We will win this thing if we do it God's way. Lay hold on eternal life to which you also are called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And then at the end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy, as he was preparing to <clears throat> go on, he said, my time, my departure at hand, so forth, so on. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Three things. I fought a good fight. I finished my race and I kept the faith. What is the foundation? What is the basis of our ability to say we can fight a good fight? That we can overcome. That we can win. That we can come out on top and not on the bottom every time. The foundation and the basis of this is the fact that way back a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, a little over, a little less, right around 2,000 years ago, our Heavenly Father made a covenant. And he didn't just make a covenant, he cut a covenant. When you talk, the Bible talks about covenants, it was always a cutting that was involved. And the father cut a covenant, not with mankind, but for mankind, through the representative of mankind, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ entered into covenant on our behalf. We had nothing to covenant with. We had nothing to bring to the table. We had nothing to offer God, but Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived the perfect life, and he died the, sin, uh, the, the death of sinners for those who were sinners so that we who were sinners could have that perfected and righteous living and righteous life. The Father made a covenant with his son, Jesus Christ. And I want to just interject this right here. Every blessing that you receive, every prayer that you get answered, every good deed, every good thing that comes from God to you is based on the fact that Jesus made a covenant on your behalf. It's not because you did something good. It's because you accepted what he did. The Father entered into covenant with his son, Jesus Christ, and all of our blessings are covenant blessings. That's why the Bible says, God, for Christ's sake, forgives us. He doesn't forgive us because we want to be forgiven. He doesn't give us because we wish we hadn't done anything wrong. He forgives us for Christ's sake. Never ever think you're going to get a prayer answered because you've been good enough. It's always because Jesus Christ entered into the place of sin on your behalf so you can become the righteousness of God in Christ and then God can bless you through that. Everything we receive is a covenant blessing. My salvation is a covenant reality. My peace is a covenant fact. My joy is a covenant privilege. My health is a covenant fact. My emotional and mental strength and freedom is done because of a covenant reality. My prosperity is covenant based. My protection and safety is a covenant provision. My victory is a covenant reality. And my redemption is a blood covenant sealed and ratified, permanent and eternal. No one can break this covenant. You say, well, what if I'm bad enough to break the covenant? You can't be bad enough to break the covenant. 
God's covenant was for all mankind and all sin. Some people say, well, you think they can be saved? They have been so bad. You know what? In reality, no one is any worse than another. The Bible says all have sinned come short of the glory of God. We've broken God's law, and breaking God's law simply means any of them. The law is like a chain. You break one link of a chain, and the whole chain's broken. And so all of us are at the place of needing a Savior. And Jesus is that Savior. We are marked people. We're marked by his covenant. We're set apart by his covenant. We're people of a blessing because of his covenant. We're people with a destiny because of his covenant. The covenant holds no matter what happens on this earth. I, let me tell you, they can try to vote it out, but the covenant's going to stand because the covenant stands above and beyond man's desires, man's whims, man's fancies, man's laws, and man's rules. The covenant always stands. Psalm 89, 34 says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God's a covenant-keeping God. So then the valid question that we need to ask today is this. Why then am I not experiencing all these things? Why? Maybe you've asked yourself, maybe you said, but you know what, what Pastor, I, I'm, not, I'm not experiencing these things you just mentioned. I'm not experiencing all this stuff you've talked about, the desires of covenant. Why must we have, we see, the prize doesn't always go to the most talented, the most gifted, the most experienced. Have you ever seen one who shouldn't have been able to win a race and win the race simply because they were more determined? They were more dogged, determined to not give up. And they finished the race and ended up winning. Sometimes the prize doesn't go to those who are most talented. And you can say, well, I'm a very talented person. But the prize of winning the victory in Christ Jesus doesn't come just because we've got a winning personality. We've got talent. We've got charisma. Sometimes the prize goes to the one who just would not quit. Who just continued to fight along the way. Many times a less gifted person has gained the prize simply by saying, I'm going to stick it out. Refusal to give up or to give in is a part of winning in the equation. You see, you got to keep on walking. you got to keep on pursuing. you got to keep on praying, keep on believing, keep on serving, and keep on seeking his will and his dream for your life. So we ask the question, then, why must I fight? It looks like since it's a done deal, it's a covenant thing, why must we fight? Let me first say this. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. The battle's already been won. But we have to appropriate that in our lives because we have an enemy. And we talked about this last week. We talked about it nearly every week. The enemy, his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. And we are in the midst of that struggle. So there is a battle going on in the earth. You've heard me say this before. Life on earth is a battle. We live in a battleground, not a playground. There's an enemy that comes. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, well, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but it looks like flesh and blood we're wrestling against. But our enemy is adept to taking situations and circumstances. We've got a lot of them going on right now used to destroy to destroy, to steal, kill, and destroy. Faith is a battle. It must be fought. It must be won if we're to live in victory. That's why we must fight, must fight because we've got to win the battle of faith. We've got to have faith. And the first point today is to win the battle of faith, your fears must be dealt with. So how do we win the battle of faith? We've got to deal with our fears. Don't tell me fear hasn't tried to creep up on you. I mean... Maybe you were one of the ones who ran out and bought up all the toilet paper. <laughs> that was a fear. It was fear-driven. Can you imagine life without toilet paper? Well, look, the days of leaves and grass are over. We want toilet paper. <laughs> I was so crazy. I was so, 
I thought, what's going on? I went to the dollar store and people were toting toilet paper out like crazy and the shelves were getting empty. I said, give me some of that. I'm, I'm, I went on that, that school mentality, you know, one fish bites, they all bite. I said, give me some toilet paper too. What's the deal going on? They said, they're out of toilet paper in Texarkana. The old Walmart has no toilet paper. I thought, give me some toilet paper. I should have bought sanitizer and handy wipes, huh? <laughs> <clears throat> Don't tell me fear hasn't tried to creep into you as maybe you thought your income might be. And some of your income has been cut back. We've got to win the battle. Uh, to, to win the battle of faith, we've got to deal with our fears. Fear cannot be our thought pattern. Fear cannot be wished away. It cannot be hoped away. It cannot be thought away. It must be spoken away. You must speak it. The Bible says you will have what you say you have. Don't just sit around and say, man, I just wish I didn't have this fear. I hope I don't get fear. And fear creeps on you all the time. To win the battle of faith, you've got to deal with fears. Fear and faith, though they are opposite, <clears throat> they're the same. Faith is confidence in God that puts you at his disposal, knowing he's going to work his good works through you. Fear is a confidence in the enemy and his ability to bring his bad things to you. So when I'm living in fear, I'm afraid God's not going to provide for me. I'm putting my faith in my enemy to provide what he wants rather than my faith in my God to provide what he wants for me. We must do the battle of fear. We must win the battle of fear. Fear must res be resisted aloud in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell you a little story real quick. Before Michelle and I got married, it's been 40 some years ago now. I was living single in Arkansas. I was living in a big old house that I rented. It cost me 85 bucks a month for that big old house, you know. <laughs> and I was living, but it was kind of a creakety old house. And I was learning a lot of spiritual things. And there was a lot of spiritual warfare going on. And I would come home at night after being out, you know, at a football game somewhere till midnight and come in. And, and I would get to that door and I'd start to open that door and I'd feel fear creeping on me. And I didn't really want to walk in the house. I was scared. I thought, this is not supposed to be because I knew about walking in faith. So you know what I'd do? I would speak it. And I didn't whisper it. I would unlock the door. I would kick the door open and run in the house like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And when I said that, I was making a declaration that Jesus is my shepherd and he's going to watch. It. The shepherd watches over you. And you know, it got to where fear didn't like hang around that because I got a sneaking suspicion. I can't see in the spirit all that well, but I think when the enemy's around, he tries to bring something and use the word of God against him. It's like that sword of the spirit jabs him and they just quit coming around. They don't like that. Be sure that you don't sit there and just mull over and cook in your, you know, sometimes we simmer in our fears. Don't do that. You just speak it right now. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You can, go, you can go ahead and follow it on up and say, I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil. Ain't no shadow ever hurt me yet. <laughs> Speak to your fears. Call them to notice and dismiss them. Do not let fear have a place in your life. You see, it was not fear. I mean, it was not the winds and the waves that caused Peter to sink. It was his fear. If you read that passage, it said, Jesus said, come on out, Peter. He said, okay, fresh with the fresh word of God. He stepped out of that boat. I'm not going to step off of here, but <laughs> he stepped out of that boat, began to walk toward Jesus. And then notice what he said. He noticed the wind and he noticed the waves and he saw those things and he began to be fearful and he began to sink. You see, you keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't sink, but you take your eyes on him. You look at your circumstances. I'm going to tell you, every one of us have enough circumstances in our lives they could sink us. They could destroy us. But you see, I'm not living by circumstance. I'm living by divine destiny. And I depend on my God to meet my needs. So I do not, I, I do battle fear, but that's the key word. I do battle fear. I don't sit back and let fear come up on me. I, a lot of times I wake up in the morning, there's just this, this spirit of dread, this spirit of fear that tries to come on me, I say, I'm not going to put up with it. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it, it's not that you're not going to have those days. It's that you need to get through those days by quoting the word of God back to that spirit of fear because the Bible says that his word is truth. And truth supersedes fact. The fact is, you may be living in hard times. The fact is, you may be having a lot of things coming against you. But the truth is, Jesus Christ has overcome them all. So in these days, we've got to battle because we've got to win the fight of fear. There's a whole lot more I could say about that. 
But let me just say this. Faith is a magnet that draws the good things of God to you. Fear is also a magnet that draws the bad things to you. You want to walk with faith and draw good things or walk in fear and let the bad things come to you. Fear is what kept Israel from entering the promised land. They were afraid. They said, we look like grasshoppers. And Joshua and Caleb said, yes, but our God is with us. And they said, yeah, but they will step on us and squash us. And Joshua and Caleb said, we can take the land. And they said, no, we can't. And fear permeated the camp. And they said, we're not going in. The Bible says they would not enter because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief is the same thing as fear. They would not have faith. Yes, you've got to win the battle of faith. If you're going to win the battle of faith, you must deal with your fears. Second thing. To win the battle of faith, your faith must be applied. You say, that doesn't make, that's, that doesn't make good sense. Yes, it does make, it makes perfect sense. The Bible says God has given us all the measure of faith. We've all got the faith. Can you imagine a carpenter coming to your house and you've got a job for him to do and he goes in the house and leaves all his tools out there and he comes in and says, man, I just don't know. I can't seem to get this job done. Well, where are your tools? Well, I've got all the tools I need. Well, why don't you get them and put them to use? Well, I don't need to use them. I've got them all. That's all. As long as I've got them, that's all that really matters. You see, you can have faith but not apply faith. You've got to take your faith out and apply it. And, and that's, where we, that's where we fall so far short. When I talk about pertinent information for practical application, we have the information, but we're not practically applying it. You've got to go out there and apply it every day. Oh, it's easy to have faith sitting in here. You can say, oh, man, that's good. But when you get out there and you're nasty here and now, then you've got to apply that faith and you've got to speak that faith. You've got to declare your faith. You've got to stand on that faith and do not receive anything else. It must be applied. It doesn't matter how many tools you have unless you use them. God's hands are often tied because we speak negative. He says, as you speak it, you will have it. As you believe in your heart, so will it be. And so we go out there and we look and we listen to all the negative news. And that's what 99% of the news is negative. We listen to all that and we fill ourselves with that. And we wonder why we're not living in faith. Why we're not overcoming in this world. We've got to take our faith and apply it. Let me show you one way you apply your faith. You remember David and Goliath? Say yes. I know you remember, but I wanted you to just acknowledge it. <laughs> Make sure you're still awake. I mean, I hadn't, for, for like three months, I hadn't had, any, hadn't had anybody to really respond back to me, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I, it's good to have somebody respond back. It's so exciting to be watching, scroll up, somebody say, amen, preach it, brother. I mean, I, that's good. So, so David defeated Goliath. Look, Goliath was light years ahead of David in the experience department. He was a seasoned warrior. David had been a shepherd. Oh, yes, he had fought a bear and a lion. He, he won them. But he had never fought a giant like Goliath before. He had never fought that. Goliath was a seasoned warrior. And David was a young boy. But though Goliath was ahead of David in the experience department, David was ahead of Goliath in the courage department. He said, notice what he said, the same God, I love this. You can use this, it, it works every day. The same God who gave me the lion and the bear will also give me that Philistine dog out there. The same God. The same God who brought you through the last trial will bring you through this trial. Yeah, but this one seems more impossible. Nothing is more impossible or less impossible to God. The same God. Goliath was ahead of David in the preparation department. He had battle scars. He was trained. He had weapons. But David was ahead of him in the faith department. That same God. Goliath was a professional with training. David was an amateur with trust. I'll take an amateur with trust above a professional with training every time, won't you? Because, you see, when you are an amateur with trust, you're tapping into the resources of the God who has everything and knows everything and can do everything. Goliath was depending on his training, his ability, and his uh, armor, but David was just trusting in the God who brought him there. I have to choose between the two. I choose David's way all the time. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Cast down every imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Don't let your mind run rampant into the fears of this world. 
Oh, what if this? What if that? What if? What if Jesus Christ shows up on your behalf and turns the tide for you? That's a, bigger, that's a bigger probability than you know if you'll just put your faith and trust in him. Let him have his way. Third thing, to win the battle of faith, your allegiance must be to Christ. Look, we can't have this split allegiance. On Sunday mornings, my allegiance is to Christ, but on Saturday night, my allegiance is to my party time, my fun time, my crowd, my, my people I hang out with. You've got to have an allegiance to Christ that's, uh, that's an allegiance 24-7. Every day, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the Bible says. It also says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Faith comes by hearing what? The word of God. You got to stay close communion with Jesus Christ. You got to stay in touch. Faith comes by staying in touch with Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus has never had a single faithless thought? And the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. So why don't we use that mind instead of our own mind? Why don't we use the mind of Christ that doesn't have a faithless thought? Jesus walked up to the tomb of Lazarus, and Lazarus had been dead for four days, and the Bible said King James, eyes. that makes it more, more impactful, King James. Surely he stinketh. <laughs> I mean, he didn't just stink, he stank. Surely he stinketh. And the Bible said that Jesus prayed and asked the Father. But it says he prayed because the people who were listening, he already knew what the Father was going to do. He had no doubt that Lazarus was going to come out. He wasn't begging God to bring Lazarus out. He was saying, all right, now you see, this is, this is the key to learning. And you learn this. You ask the Father and it'll happen. You've got to stay in allegiance with Jesus Christ day in, day out, all the time. You have to give him all, not part. Not some to him and some to someone else. I love the, the little thing we use for faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. I don't trust you. I don't trust anybody else. When this thing hit and this thing happened, the enemy said, you know what? Things are going to fall apart. You're going to fall. Your church is going to fall apart. People are going to stray and never come back. And I said, forsaking all, I trust him. Because see, people's faith is not in a body. It's not in uh, a society. It's in Jesus Christ. And I said, the church will be back. In fact, I made a declaration that, that not only that we're not going to, only are we going to prosper, we're going to grow. I believe we're going to grow through this thing. I believe we haven't even sun, begun to see what we're going to do. Don't just worship him for his help. Worship him for who he is. He is worthy of our worship. If he never did another thing for you, do you think it was enough to to save you and forgive your sin and take you to heaven when you die? If that's all there was, that would be way more than we deserve. But it's not all there is. He says, I not only died to take you to heaven to be with me, I'm going up to heaven myself to the right hand of the Father. I'm going to intercede for you while you're here on this earth. And I will send you another comforter just like me. He will not only be with you, he will be in you. And he will empower you to do what I did. He will be in you. There's a lot of talk these days about all the miracles have passed away. You can't expect God to step, show up and do anything other than save you. But once he saves you, kinda, he kind of just lets you go. That's a bunch of baloney. That's the Greek word for what I used that, baloney. He is in me. And he said, I'm in you to do what I did while I was here. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial surrender is still rebellion. You say, well, I'm surrendering this part of my life. No, if you're not surrendering all, you're still in rebellion. If you're only obeying part of what God says to do in his word and he's spoken to you, some of you have words that God's spoken to you and you're being partially obedient, then if you're partially obedient, you're still disobedient. Because obedience is 100% zero. It's all or none. I, I know for years I tried to talk God into letting me be partially obedient, but he didn't hear that prayer. He didn't honor that prayer. The Bible says, let me do it a moment ago, I fought the fight, I fought the fight, good fight, I finished the race, I kept my faith. You know what it says right after that? There is therefore laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but all those who love his appearing. Let me tell you, we're not serving for nothing. We're, there are, we're, we're laying up treasure in heaven. God's going to, the righteous, he's got 
rewards for them. The crowns are rewards that he will receive. So we fight the good fight. There is laid up for us the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give. I'd rather live with the possibilities of my faith than the certainties of my failure or my unbelief. The quality of our life is directly determined by whether we feed on truth or trash. Did you know that? What are you feeding on, truth or trash? Feed on truth, not trash. Garbage in, garbage out. We feed on the trash of this world, the trash is going to come out. You cannot feed on trash and expect to live in triumph. Faith takes a step. Sometimes we're required to step out. Step out where, you know, the Bible says, the words are a lamp on my feet and a light on my path. The lamp on the foot simply showed enough for the next step. You've got faith for the next step. We've got to step out. Things sometimes don't happen until we step out. Faith steps out before the miracle steps in. Let, let me give you a couple examples, and, and we're going to close. The priest had to step out into the Jordan River before it parted. Can you imagine how foolish they might have felt if they had not had faith? You mean me step out in that river? Huh? I, Peter had to step out of the boat before the water could support him. I can imagine him hanging on the side of the boat and his foot going down in the water. Man, this ain't going to work. I, I can't believe it. I'm sinking. He had to step out of the boat. The, the Red Sea parted only when they got to it and needed it. It wasn't parted when they got there. In Jehoshaphat's army, the enemy was not destroyed until the praisers and the players began to sing and worship. That's when the enemy was defeated. The walls of Jericho fell when they shouted. They marched seven days, but when they shouted, that's when they fell. Moses had to throw down the rod before it became a snake. He had to pick it back up before it became the rod of God. You see, there's a step. There's things. You've got to do something. Usually, if not always, I won't say always, but usually God says, if you'll take this step, you'll see it's going to happen. We've got to step out first. Abraham had to move out of his land before God could reveal the next step. You see, I will not possess victory in any area of my life where I've been reluctant to exercise my faith. Exercise our faith. That's why it's so important that we battle. We must step out. You can outlast your present problem by standing on God's provisional promise. Okay, let me ask, let's get real. You don't have to raise your hand because I know. Anybody here got a problem? Of course you do. We've all got problems. We've all got troubles. I heard a sermon God's first sermon is supposed to have three points and a poem. He was in seminary and they said, you got to have a title, three points, and a poem. And the title was Problems. First point was, I got them. Second point was, you got them. Third point was, Adam had them. I mean, the poem was, Adam had them. We all got problems. We all got issues. We've all got situations. So we don't need to say, oh, I don't have any problems. No, we all got problems. The problems are temporary, but the promises are eternal. But it takes faith. When we come to the end of our own ability, that's when we come to the beginning of God's ability. Just come to the place and say, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. He said, I've been waiting for you to get to that place. Now trust me. Are you ready to turn over everything to him? I want you just to bow your heads with me. Because I want you to be thinking, not looking right now. Think about this. Whatever the problem is that you're having, whatever the situation, whatever the giant that may be facing you, whatever fear is coming against you, refuse to let that paralyze you. You say, yeah, but you don't understand about, I've messed up so many times in the past. I just, I'm just afraid to take, take another step. Refuse to be paralyzed by your past. Choose instead to be focused on your future. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Throughout these last three months, 
several times things would come to me that we need to pray for for people and we've done this before but I feel like we need to pray again I, I know there are some here who have some apprehensions about where this is going I'll be honest with you except for the grace of God knowing that God was in control we, we should have apprehensions things are not the way they ought to be but this world is moving in that direction. And the Bible says in these days, it's going to move in that direction. If you've got some fears about things, I want to just pray over you. It doesn't matter what it's about. You don't have to say what it's about. If you'll just stand right where you are, I want to pray over those. It may be financial fears. It may be health fears, health issues that you don't know, and you've got some fears over those things. Remember this, fear is not of God. And the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, so spirit, fear is a spirit. We're going to pray right now. Father, I pray over these who are standing, and I pray that your abundant provision will be manifested and that fear will be defeated in Jesus' name. We declare fear is not a place. We break the hold of fear. We cancel the assignment of the enemy to bring fear on these lives. By standing, they're standing by saying, I want to walk in faith and not by fear. We just right now cancel the permissions that have been granted for fear, that spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. And we declare you uh, an alien and a trespasser and command you to leave these properties of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Fear be gone right now. We release the abundant provision of faith, that faith may rise and that faith may take hold of the promise of God and stand on that promise and cling to that promise so that the reality of that promise can become a reality in that life physically. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, if you're here, you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you're watching online and you never put your faith in Christ Jesus, this is the time to do it. These are the days to do it. The Bible says we do not know what tomorrow is going to bring, so all we have is right now. All you have to do is say, Father, I ask you to forgive me for my sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my salvation. I receive that right now, Jesus. Come into my life and be my Savior and be my Lord. I'll live for you the rest of my life. Then thank him for doing it. Thank him for doing it. That's going to wrap up our live stream. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week.